Ah, where's the boss? <clears throat> he went, his, the boss is gone. <laughs> Still drinking coffee. <laughs> okay. Yeah, he, he complains about me drinking coffee. He drinks. <laughs> it's like, have you been drinking coffee, anyone? Have you been drinking coffee? Have you, been drinking coffee? you have? Okay. Okay. Good. Well, well done. Excellent. No, that doesn't matter to me. Are you sure? Yeah. Because you are late because of coffee drinking. Okay. So you. <laughs> No, that's good. Please, I'm just messing around. So let's uh, let's get started here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I was yeah. Anyway. Okay. So let's uh, get into the uh, questions. Uh, so uh, as usual, there's a lot of questions. We have to get started uh, straight away. So here we go. Dear Ajahn, there is. There is a dearth of Dhamma speakers, both monks and laity in Malaysia. And not just Malaysia, in the entire world, that is a problem. Potential Dhamma speakers may fear creating bad karma. What advice would you give to resolve the shortage of Dhamma speakers? Uh, uh, ad uh, advice for lay speakers to be a Sukiho too. Um, okay, so uh, the... Um, but speaking, you know, making bad karma, usually if you, if you feel that you are, re if you rely on the suttas mostly, huh, and you talk about things that you feel you, where you understand the suttas, huh, you cannot really make much bad karma. If your intention is good huh, and you don't go beyond what you are able to talk about, huh, normally there's no, there's no problem there. So you just have to be honest and sometimes if you don't know, to say that you don't know. Huh, and then uh, when you, you know, then usually uh, you're fine. There's kind of no, uh, there's no big issue there, uh, usually. So I would always recommend people to be Dhamma speakers if they can. Yeah, and those people, those of you who are knowledgeable, uh, people like, um, you know, uh, uh, Wayne, do you want to be a Dhamma speaker? <laughs> Give me assistance. Okay, yeah. I think you should be the leader. You know? I, I, can be, I can be your assistant, maybe. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Say again? You need more meditation, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes the meditation becomes because you are a Dhamma speaker, you know? Speaking of the meditation happens afterwards, yeah. <laughs> Uncertain. Yeah. And uh, Niwur, Niwur is probably already a Dhamma speaker. He's going to do one of them. Yeah. So he's uh, yeah, his assistant. Yeah. Yeah. So don't be afraid. Being a, being a speaker on Dhamma is actually is almost like a privilege. Uh, yeah. Because uh, it is when you speak about the Dhamma, you learn so much yourself. Uh, the person who learns the most in the crowd is not you guys. I learn the most, uh, yeah, because I have to think about what I say. Uh, I have to, uh, and if I have doubts about something, I have to kind of look it up and check it out. Uh, and so, Dhamma speaker is one who teaches the most, uh, learns the most. Uh, so uh, it's actually a great, uh, it's a wonderful thing to be able to do to teach Dhamma. So if you have the chance, uh, do so, but just be humble about it. Be careful. Be gentle. You can't really go too wrong. And if you have doubts, you can ask someone else who knows. So um, that is what I would uh, say. But there's a lack of Dhamma speakers everywhere. And this is why these days I said no to most of my invitations to travel, even though I travel a lot. And uh, last year I was in the United States for a whole month traveling around the U.S. Uh, and they wanted me to come back. Uh, and I had to say no, because uh, Ajahn Brahm said no. <laughs> <laughs> Ajahn Ram said, spend more time in Perth, right? Uh, and uh, he's right. Uh, and so I said no to the... But I mean, it's kind of fun to go to the U.S. because it's more like a, it's a different place, a different field, different kind of people. So it's always a challenge to teach new people. Uh, but then um, I, I can't really go there anymore. Uh, and so, it's, you know, it's interesting. How do you prioritize where you should go anyway? Uh, and uh, there's kind of, you know, it's, sometimes it's very difficult to say how the prioritizing should be, but very often you prioritize people that you already have been dealing with for a long time. So there's kind of the sense of loyalty to people that you know reasonably well. So that is one sense of priority. Yeah. So, uh, you know, when you have a long established relationship with someone, you tend to go there. But, uh, you know, um, future is always uncertain. You don't know what's going to happen next. There comes a point when Ajahn Brahm will not want to travel so much anymore. I don't know what's going to happen to him now. And then he will tell me to stay in Perth, and then things kind of, you know, become less. And what you have to do, invite more, invite other monks from Bodhinyana Monastery. Yeah, we have other young monks, great monks there, who are, you know, ready to, sure, they would be very happy to be invited and come here. I mean, you already had Venerable Chunda and Bodhidharma recently. 
but we have other monks who are really, really knowledgeable about Dhamma and very inspiring and good meditators and all of these kind of things. They're all there. You just have to kind of figure out who it is and then invite them there. And uh, of course, not just Bodhinyana Monastery, but other places too, you find uh, good speakers. You, you had Venerable Akaliko here, is that right? Was he here? Yeah? Okay. Was he good? Huh? Yeah? He's kind of good fun. He's kind of a bit more, does things a bit differently. So he, uh, yeah. <laughs> so you have different kinds of, uh, different kinds of people. Huh? So, um, all right. Um, so how to resolve the shortage? Yeah, I, you know, I wonder why to resolving is a bit too kind of, yeah, you, you have to teach yourself and then maybe you have to become a monk or nun yourself. Yeah, and then uh, you become a Dhamma speaker afterwards. Uh, so we have, uh, apart from Venerable Chunda, who was already here, we have a couple of more um, monks who hail from Malaysia at our monastery, Venerable Radha, who is, uh, yeah, Venerable Radha, member Jotika, they used to be uh, uh, Lei, Han, and... Uh, and Lai Peng, exactly. Uh, and they used to be members of the BGF. Uh, and now they are monastics. And both of them are really, really good monastics. Uh, so one day you will have to invite them to come here and give talks. Uh, yes. And see what happened to them. See how they have changed or whatever. <laughs> That's nice. And we have Venerable Jayako, who is uh, he's a bit younger. He is uh, from uh, Penang originally. Uh, and he is really, he's, he's really good fun. He's kind of this joker. And he likes to joke around and mess around. He's, he's great. Uh, I'm sure he will be very entertaining when he gives his first Dhamma talk. <laughs> yeah. I can imagine he will be, he will be good. Uh. And so that's kind of nice to kind of bring in somebody, you know, who actually come from Malaysia originally. Uh, uh, but there's also many other monks who are really uh, kind of uh, interesting and, uh, and uh, so you may invite down the track. Uh, otherwise, you have to do the work yourself. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Venerable Punsu, you want to have, give some advice about that? Uh? You want to give some advice about how to get more Dhamma speakers in Malaysia? How can they get more Dhamma speakers? What should they do? Huh? They have to look for it. <laughs> I think they're looking for you. They're looking at you right now. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many teachers. Maybe this have AI translation. <laughs> yeah. speaking Thai, AI kind of gets mixed into English. Yeah. That's, that's the way forward. Yeah. Use technology. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So let's go on to the next one. Now. Uh, if you can do that, you can invite Ajahn Gandhi to come here and then have an AI translation. That would be, would be nice, wouldn't it? Uh, and it comes out completely distorted. You know what he's talking about. And it comes out. Uh, that's kind of the danger of AI. You never know what's going to come out the other end there. And then you can have simultaneous translation into AI, Hokkien, Cantonese. Uh, yeah, and you can have this really large crowd. Everyone hears a different language, you know. <laughs> You've got to use technology for something useful, right? Instead of kind of all the silly things. Uh. Say again? Searching up stuff. Uh, yeah? Huh? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe you should ask AI for who, how to get more Dhamma speakers. See what the AI says. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, let's move on to the next one. We're getting sidetracked here. Hi, Arjan. How do we deal, handle with a person who always uh, have, who is always fault finding? Uh, and if the person is not aware of his or her fault finding mind, what Will it lead the person to her? How do you deal with someone who's a fault finder? You have compassion for them right? because they are in trouble. Yeah, someone who's always find, fault finding have they have a miserable life. Yeah, it's not nice to be always fault finding, always saying the fault in everything. It's actually really miserable. Right? And to someone like that, you can have compassion for them. If you look at them, probably don't look very happy. They are probably yay fault finding. No, it doesn't work like that. Yeah, fault finding, grumbling away, always a bit miserable. Right? That's usually that kind of person. So have compassion for them. Give them a hug. Yeah, put your arm around the shoulder and say it's all right. Yeah, don't worry so much. Yeah, you know I'll, I'm your friend. I'm here. Yeah. yeah, be kind to them. Kindness usually opens up your ability to self-criticize. Yeah? If we criticize other people, very often they will not listen. Yeah? But if you are kind to them, people are open, usually able to self-criticize. They can see their own faults. Yeah? The best criticism is when you see your own faults, rather than other people telling you. And to enable yourself to open up, you have to feel safe. 
Yeah. Very often we hold on to our past habits, maybe because we don't feel safe. So make them feel safe. Yeah, it's okay. Give them a cup of tea and say, let's sit down and have a nice chat. I'll tell you some dumber stories or whatever and see what happens. Yeah? Sometimes it's weird. One day people suddenly click. Actually, maybe I'm behaving silly. Maybe I shouldn't have a sort of fault-finding mind. And one day they kind of turn around. I've looked at myself. I've been a monk now for almost 30 years. Is that a long time? I don't know. It seems, yeah, it seems like a fairly, I guess, fairly long now, actually. Uh, but, uh, you know, the mind has changed enormously over those 30 years. I'm a very different person now from what I was 30 years ago. And you probably wouldn't even recognize me if you saw me 30 years ago and thought, who is this fellow? And I kind of, okay, get, you know. <laughs> and you, yeah, you would know probably up from down, it would seem very different. So the mind is so changeable. Sometimes all we can do is to be kind. Don't try hard, too hard to change them because you're going to suffer if you try to change other people. What will it lead the person to? Yeah, it will. It leads usually to bad things to be too fault finding. Yeah, it's not a positive thing. Uh, the person may have many other good qualities, however. So it depends on how it balances out overall. Uh, but uh, if fault finding is only one of many bad qualities, then they are in trouble. But if fault finding is only one bad quality among many good ones, then probably it may actually be all right. Uh, so uh, yeah, it always depends on the balance of qualities overall. All right. There is no magic bullets in, in uh, changing other people. Uh, and you see these things a lot of the time. People want to change others. Uh, yeah, you see this, these questions come up all the time. How can I change my children? How can I change my husband? How can I change my wife? Uh, how can I change my old parents who are dying and they're not really nice? Uh, how can I change this person? We, and this idea of changing others is usually very problematic. Yeah? And in the end, all we can do is change ourselves. And when we change ourselves and we become kinder, then some, something happens with people around us. Yeah, they start to change too. It's kind of weird how that works. And so by you changing, by you becoming better, it has an impact on the people around you. That's often the best way. Yeah. Okay. Dear Arjan, the person with obsessive, a person with obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, situation is made worse with the last few years of COVID. As a result, he is frequently in anger. How to give him understanding that he is just suffering from mental formations? This mind tried to give some understanding. Not sure if correct info, okay? Mm -hmm. This mind gives some, some understanding but cannot come from the spouse. It is not working as he is looking from a colored lens. Could Ajahn please advise with some perspectives? Thank you, Ajahn. Um, yeah, so COVID has caused some people to suffer more and some people to suffer less. Some people loved COVID, some people hated COVID. It really depends on your, yeah, depends on your attitude and your, you know, what your mind was like beforehand. Uh, and so, uh, so someone is frequently angry. Yeah, that's kind of really painful. Yeah, when someone gets fr ang frequently angry, it's not a nice life at all. If you get angry all the time, it's really a lot of suffering. Uh, um, so again, this is this idea of... Um, you know, changing someone else and trying to make them understand. And it's not always easy, especially as you say, you know, if, you, if it is a spouse or whatever. Uh, what you have to do is you have to, uh, often you have to find someone that they respect, uh, some can give them some good advice. Uh, you may not be able to give that advice, but maybe someone like Ajahn Brahm can give a good advice, yeah? So when Ajahn Brahm comes in next time, bring this person to the talk with Ajahn Brahm uh, and listen, and maybe sometimes it's strange, and then maybe send... Give this question to Ajahn Brahm yeah, and say, Ajahn, please talk about you know, how to deal with the anger or whatever yeah, and, and see, what, see what happens as a consequence. Uh, and sometimes just listening to someone like Ajahn Brahm can be enough to change somebody uh, and the kind of your outlook changes as a consequence. Uh, so, uh, but um, anger is never a really a good response to things in the world. Uh, yeah, anger doesn't really work. Uh, anger is always kind of counterproductive. Uh, it goes down the wrong way. Uh, and it causes us to suffer, it causes other people to suffer. 
And so instead of getting angry about things, we need to kind of just learn to see the world as other people suffering, other people being trapped in what they are doing. No one really wants to hurt us. It's just that other people just, uh, they are caught in their own conditioning and they're doing what they can. And sometimes what they can is not very good. And so then we get angry in return, but uh, it's like getting angry at the robot, uh, getting angry at the computer program. Yeah, the computer program just does what it does. It can't really change. Your anger is not going to make any, make any difference. And that's why we don't tend to get so angry with computers. Actually, sometimes we do, but, <laughs> but usually we can deal with it when it comes to computers. Uh, but people are the same, yeah? And so we kind of just learn to see, see the suffering in the world and see the problems in the world. Uh, anger is not really the solution. Uh, and uh, it's quite uh, obvious in many ways from the Buddhist point of view. It comes down to the idea of non-self. Uh, people are not in control of their lives, yeah? We talked about these things before on this retreat. Uh, uh, turning away from anger is not that hard. Uh, it just takes a little bit of um, kind of uh, thinking and contemplating here, uh, and then you can come around after a while by uh, thinking in the right way here. Uh. So uh, still, yeah, you feel compassion for people like that because often they are trapped. They are also trapped within their anger. So again, be kind to them. This is the most important thing. Uh. And sometimes when you are kind, sometimes they see their own faults because simply be because of the kindness. Uh. I know it's interesting. You know, when you have a teacher like Ajahn Brahm, he. Uh, never tells you off, he never says anything to you, but uh, in a sense that makes you all the more aware that you have to be your own critique. You have to look at yourself because Ajahn Ram is not going to say anything, he's just going to be kind. And so you start looking at yourself for your own flaws and start to find the solution to those things. So you take more responsibility in that sense. So kindness has a powerful effect on people. And if you can do that to this person not to anyone, uh, sometimes it has very beneficial effects in the long run. Sometimes it don't because it's complicated things. Uh, but uh, yeah. Anyway, let's uh, move on to the next one. Huh? Sukihotu <coughs> Ajahn. My deepest gratitude, Ajahn, for your patience and understanding and answering all my questions with regard to my children. I did recognize the handwriting, so I knew, <laughs> I knew who it was. And also, uh, yeah, and also pay, taking the time to answer their, cha their challenging question. I'm very grateful for the supportive conditions for me to attend Ajahn Sutta retreat this year. You're absolutely hilarious, Ajahn. Okay, I'm glad that, that, glad it's kind of I'm learning from Ajahn Brahm a little here. So your jokes are getting more witty, quirky, and bold. And this is, this is great, as it will help me retain the sutras learned. Now I understand why it's important to listen to the teaching of the Dhamma from Sanghas. Your storytelling makes the Dhamma come to life. Gee, this is really nice. Okay. Uh, really hope Ajahn will be able to have another sutra retreat later this year, because it is a boost our motivation to practice the path. Thanks very much, Meta. Okay, good. I'm very happy that uh, this is um, that this is happening to you. So that's wonderful. Uh, and uh, this is kind of the idea uh, to learn the Dhamma in a nice way. You have to be relaxed, and it has to be a good environment. Uh, and this is, I think, one of the reasons why someone like Ajahn Brahm always likes to keep it light. Uh, yeah, and uh, that's kind of a a, a nice way of uh, of doing things. Uh, so great. Thank you so much for that kind feedback. Much appreciated. All right, next one. Dear Ajahn, I just wanted to tell you that today, while I was meditating, I had a mini realization. I finally realized what grasping really is and how letting go of attachment can bring peace. I realized how tiring it is to continue grasping. Thank you for your teaching to help me realize this important insight. Wow, that's wonderful, isn't it? This is uh, one of those strange things. Yeah, you can hear the Dhamma year in and year out. And people talk about craving, they talk about peace, they talk about joy. And it sounds good, but until you actually see it for yourself, you don't really know what it is. And then one day, wow, that's what it means. And it actually is quite different from what you thought it was. And sometimes all the thinking gets in the way because the thinking means that your mind is kind of trying to find it in one place when actually it is found in a slightly different place. So uh, this is, uh, I'm very 
very happy to hear that. Yeah? So these are the sort of things that we live the path for. Uh, so uh, great. So well done. And uh, hopefully there will be more of such mini insights in the future. Yeah. Dear Ajahn, you said to believe things or have faith because the Buddha said it. How do we know that it was really the Buddha who said it? <laughs> this is a good question. Uh, how do you know? Um, it's impossible to know with 100% certainty. Nothing is ever 100% certain. Uh, but uh, what we do know is that uh, the, obviously the suttas come from somewhere. Yeah, these suttas exist. Uh, they are said to be spoken by the Buddha. Uh, this, in other words, who is the Buddha? The Buddha is this person who had this profound insight into the nature of reality two and a half thousand years ago. We call that person the Buddha. And uh, in the suttas, it is referred to this one person. Uh, do we have any good reason to doubt that? Uh, not really. Uh, yeah, I think, it's, I think we have very good reason to doubt that these things came from this enlightened person. Uh, who else would it come from? Uh, it is not at all obvious. Uh, and so, uh, generally speaking, you can see that there is a kind of integrity, a completeness to the suttas. They're all referring to each other. They have the same message throughout, leaning in the same direction. Uh, yeah? It is not like a hodgepodge, like many different authors kind of taught it, yeah? and kind of mixed it all up and stirred it up, and kind of, here is the Dhamma. It is not really like that. Uh, and uh, so, uh, I think Pali Canon is very homogenous, very uh, coherent, uh, and uh, the vast majority of teachings there are, to my, my mind, obviously coming from this person called the Buddha. There's a few teachings in between coming from, you know, Venerable Sariputta, Mahamogalana, Ananda, Mahakachana, Mahakotita, etc. But yet, generally speaking, I think we are on very safe grounds when you read the Sutta, Sutta Pitika, especially the four main uh, uh, Nikayas, yeah? long discourses, middle discourses, connected discourses, and numerical discourses. So... Uh, yeah, so I think uh, all the kind of research points in that direction, because these are suttas in common uh, uh, across the board. Uh, they exist in the Chinese translation, in the Agamas, they, some of them exist in Tibetan translation, some of them in Sanskrit, uh, and some in a variety of other kind of languages. Uh, actually, it's quite interesting to see how many languages there are. I will show you something uh, that may be interesting, but maybe not. We'll, <laughs> We'll find out in a second. So let's go to our favorite uh, uh, website, Sutta Central. This is one of the websites I use the most of all websites. And uh, so again, yeah, so you, I, I showed this the other day, but now you have a chance to see it again. Uh, Sutta Central, so you have the basket of discourses over here. Ding! And then we, uh, uh, we're going to go to the middle length discourses. Uh, and this is the collection. We go to the last, the final 50, and we're going to go to Majjhimanika 135, which is the, uh, the shorter analysis of deeds or actions, the Chula Kamavibanga Sutta. Now, this is the sutta that exists in most languages. You can see down the bottom here, it says parallels in ancient texts. 17 parallels in ancient texts, right? Uh, that's kind of extraordinary. So let's have a look. Yeah. Whoa. So, what this one here, that is Devanagari. I wonder what ancient text that could possibly be. How come it's in Devanagari? I don't know what that is. Then you have, uh, this here is obviously some kind of translation into Chinese. Uh, then another translation into Chinese. All of these here are Chinese, various Ch Chinese translations, various kinds of translations found in the Chinese arguments. Then you have a Kotan, one in Kotanese, a fragment of the same sutta. Another one in Chinese, uh, then another one in Pali. Then you have uh, all of these here, which are various kinds of Sanskrit suttas. Uh, yeah? So you can see SF, these are S Sanskrit uh, fragments of the same sutta. Uh, and then you have uh, something down here. Not sure what that is. Uh, so. You can see the number of parallels here in ancient languages. Actually, not as many as I thought. I wonder what kind of language that is. I have no idea what this is. This is a, let's, let's click on it and see what happens. Wow, this is definitely Devanagari. This is Sanskrit, isn't it? Yeah, this is Devanagari. This is the, this, the writing used for Sanskrit and Hindi, etc. Like Lena was saying the other day. Yeah. But uh, I wonder, wonder where this comes from, though. Don't know. Anyway. 
Uh, oh, this is the Kang Yu. Oh, okay, so it's Tibetan. This is not uh, Devanagari, it's Tibetan language. Uh, that's what it is. Uh, okay, Tibetan writing. Yeah. Well, Tibetan, they also study from Sanskrit. Yeah, but I think, the, I think this writing is Tibetan, not Sanskrit, uh, not the Devanagari. So, anyway, so, so yeah, whatever. Let's uh, leave it to one side. Let's forget about that. Okay, so let's um, uh, move on. Hi, Anna, Ajahn. Let's say if someone passes out, do we step in to, to help out? Could be from heart attack or stroke. Uh, would that be interfering with their come up? Please advise Ajahn. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, re remember that. <laughs> Come, it's, it's actually, it's not, it's not a bad question, yeah, because it, it, it helps us to understand the idea of kamma, if you think about these things in the right way. So remember that we have good kamma and bad kamma, yeah? So yes, bad kamma is that you pass out because of heart attack, yeah? but good kamma is that someone is there to help you. Yeah, that's your good kamma. So of course, we should also enjoy the good kamma. If we don't enjoy our good kamma, we are stupid. Yeah, yeah? so of course you should help out. Uh, so you're not interfering, interfering at all. You're actually doing the right thing. If we should never interfere with our bad karma, if you break a leg, it means you should never go to the doctor. You should just leave the leg broken, right? That's not called bad karma. That's called stupidity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it's called. The fact that you have a doctor means that you have the good karma to have the doctor. Of course, you should make use of that good karma. In the same way, if someone passes out, of course you should help. It means you also have the opportunity to make good karma if you help someone who passes out. Even if it's a stranger on the street, yeah? Let's say that someone has been hit by a car or something and they're lying there. Stop, yeah, stop and help the person if it's a complete stranger, yeah? because it's a beautiful opportunity. Helping a stranger is great because then you have no vested interest. You're doing it purely out of the goodness of your heart, yeah? To drive by, if you see someone who was kind of hit by a car or suffering somewhere, that's kind of a bit cold. Yeah, don't be cold. Be, have kindness for all human beings in this way. So uh, absolutely that you should help out. And uh, you will be making good karma. And the person who uh, has, been, uh, has the heart attack or the stroke, they will be very grateful. And through that gratitude, they will also be making good karma, which will be good for them in the future. Yeah, so it's good for everyone if you do this. So please don't think like that. This is kind of a very dangerous way of thinking. Some people sometimes think like this, and they say, for example, that all oh, people who are disabled or whatever is because of the bad come in the past, or they deserve it. Yeah, that's a terrible way of thinking. Yeah? If someone is disabled, they deserve compassion because they are in trouble. Next life, we will be disabled, right? Because we also have a store of karma from the past. We don't know what it is. Yeah? And so please, please always have compassion, regardless of what people have done. It doesn't matter if it's come out of the past or whatever. People don't know what they're doing anyway. We're all blind. We all deserve compassion in all of these situations. So then you're on the right track. Yeah. Next one. Dear Ajahn Brahmali, thank you for taking the time to guide us through the suttas. I used to think that the sutta was written by the Buddha, but now I know it is not written by him, but by others. Can you please share how the suttas came about? Why are there so many different suttas instead of just one? <laughs> okay, that's a nice, I never heard that question before. That's a good one, okay. How do we know whether the sutta is the real Buddha's teaching and how do we know which sutta is not? Thank you, Ajahn. Okay, so this is a bit like the previous one, but a bit more detailed. So let's, uh, let's go into this. So um, it is not written by the Buddha because at the time of the Buddha, there was no writing. Or if there was writing, it was only used for very small purposes, like uh, uh, maybe commercial transactions and that kind of thing. It was not used for religious text. And the way religious text was uh, uh, passed on from one generation to the next one was orally. So you would learn them by heart, and then you would pass it on orally to the next generation. So all of the suttas were learned by heart. And so perhaps you think that that means it is very unreliable, because if you learn by heart, how reliable can it possibly be? And if you think that, you would actually be wrong, because it is very reliable. 
Uh, one of the things about ancient India is that they had already the Vedas, which was the scriptures of the Brahmins of that time. They had already existed for over a thousand years before the Buddha, maybe 1,500 years. And these Vedas, it is well known, were, were remembered almost verbatim, of centuries after century verbatim. This is a known fact about the Vedas. And can you imagine how that is possible? Verbatim, like word for word, exactly the same. That is because they had a certain ways of dealing with the Vedas. They had a certain technology of recitation, a technology of passing on these things. They would re recite the text forward, they would recite them backwards. Right? Imagine how hard it is to recite the text backwards. But this would ensure that you remember syllable by syllable exactly what it is. They had various systems like this. You would learn them when you were very young, because when you're very young, you don't understand what you're saying. The moment you understand the words, you start to make changes in what's happening because you make inferences and you put new things in there. If you don't understand, you're just learning the sound. And that can be a very pure form of learning. So you start when you're very, very young, but by the time you are 16, you are a master of all of these Vedas. You have remembered hundreds and hundreds of pages by the time you're 16. And so, you, so this is how they had already had a system of memorizing things which meant that when the Buddhists came to the scene, that system was already in place. Many of the disciples of the Buddha were Brahmins, so they knew these kind of memorization techniques. Yeah, and so they used that in the memorizing the sutta. So actually very, a very, um, uh, a very good system, yeah, uh, for a very solid system for mem memorizing. Uh, and then maybe around a few hundred years after the Buddha, three or four hundred years after the Buddha, they started to write things down. No one knows exactly how it started or where it started. The earliest fragments of suttas that exist in the present day were found in little urns in the desert of what is now Afghanistan and Pakistan. And the very earliest ones go back to almost back to the year zero, yeah? Christian, Christian calendar. Few decades after the year zero, uh, the very earliest fragments. And they are very, very fragile. Uh, and they are being looked after by some of the uh, famous curators in the world who look after ancient manuscripts. Uh, and uh, interesting, you look at those ancient manuscripts and they are, some of them are pretty much like the suit as we have now. Uh, so it's kind of fascinating. The language is a bit different because this is a Gandhari language. Uh, Gandhari is the language of the north, very northwest of India into Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, uh, and so this is a, similar to Pali, but a little bit different in the way it is, uh, the endings and the way the words are spelled and that sort of thing. Uh, the most famous writing down of the suttas happened in Sri Lanka, in the Alu Vihara in Sri Lanka, in about the year 60 BC. That was the one famous writing down, when the whole Tibitaka supposedly was written down. And the reason was because they had some famine and problems in Sri Lanka, so nobody remembered the suttas. Uh, and there was one book, I think it was the Nidesa. The Nidesa is a commentary on the Sutta Nipata, which is one of the canonical books. Only one person remembered the Nidesa. And so they got a fright in Sri Lanka. If that one person died, that would have been it. Yeah? So quickly, before this person gets a heart attack, yeah, let's, re <laughs> let's remember it. Uh, maybe that was enough for the person to get a heart attack because it was the last person to remember it. Oh, help! <laughs> they died. You, know, you never know. Um, and so they wrote it down, yeah, and it's a strange, at that point, there was a decision made in Sri Lanka, in the Sangha, that from now on, we will focus on keeping the scriptures rather than practicing the teachings, which is like a strange thing to do, right? But on the other hand, maybe understandable, given the circumstances. And so that's why Sri Lanka became prominent, a very prominent place of looking after the scriptures for the future. Of course, there are always forest monks and maybe forest nuns around, as someone was still do the practice. But that became the main kind of uh, uh, work of the main Vihara in Sri Lanka. So then it got written down. And then once it was written down, in those days, uh, it was written down on palm leaf manuscripts. Yeah, they, they are called Ola, Ola leaves in Sri Lanka. And this is used around the world, uh, in other parts of the world, in uh, uh, Afghanistan, they used more birch bark manuscripts, but in Sri Lanka, it was palm leaf manuscripts. And they only last for a certain while. Maybe they can last a few decades, maybe a few centuries at the most. And then they have to be copied. Yeah? 
there's a continuous copying of these manuscripts. And every time you copy, it's easy to make a few mistakes. Yeah, so this is how mistakes gradually, gradually seep into the manuscripts over time. So that's how we get small changes. But if you take the oldest manuscripts that we have now, the oldest one that exists now, it goes back to about the 13th century. So that's about 800 years old. It's a Sri Lankan manuscript of part of the Vinaya Pitaka. And uh, Ajahn Sujata was able to get a copy of this. And they say this looks almost, it is very, very similar to modern, uh, the modern version. So there's almost no changes, yeah? nothing really significant. And so when you look at it like that, you see very few changes over 800 years. Then you know that these suttas are basically the same as they were before. Yeah? Then what you also do, what is also very interesting, I've, I mentioned this is, these things here many times before, but it may be nice to review again very briefly. At the time of Ashoka, you know, Emperor Ashoka existed about 200 years after the Buddha. That is when there was a large spreading out of Buddhism in India. Ashoka, he sent ambassadors of Buddhism to the various parts of India, to the north, to Gandhara, to Kashmir, uh, also to the south. One of Ashoka's son, Mahinda, and his daughter, Sangamitta, they went to Sri Lanka, yeah, and they brought Buddhism to Sri Lanka. So at that time, there was a large spread of uh, the Dhamma in kind of in India and also outside the borders of India. And this was the beginning of the different schools of Buddhism. So those schools who went to the north of India, they became the Sarvastivadana and Dharmaguptaka schools. Yeah? And the Sarvastivadana and Dharmaguptaka, they eventually, they went from Kashmir and Gandhara and they found the traders, the traders who were on the Silk Road. And the Silk Road went going all the way from Europe all the way to China, going to Xi'an and Luoyang and the ancient capitals of China. So the monks would go on the Silk Road and they would kind of hitchhike with the traders. Yeah? that would go all the way into China. And then when they got to China, they would translate it into Chinese characters. And that's how the Sarvastivadana school and Dharmaguptaka school got translated into Chinese. And in the, until the present day, those suttas translated into Chinese still exist in the Chinese Buddhist canon. So we find that the Chinese Buddhist canon is enormous because it has so much... Uh, 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 but a, a tiny part of it is early suttas, uh, yeah? So it is still there in the Chinese Buddhist canon. And then when you take those suttas in the Chinese Buddhist canon uh, and you translate them into English or, or you just read Chinese, if you can read Chinese, uh, this is not easy to read even if you know how to read Chinese. This is like ancient Chinese, yeah? It is actually quite different. The meaning of words has changed and, and all of these kind of things. Uh, but if you can read it, and I know some scholars who can read that. They can also read Sanskrit, they can also read Pali, they can also read Tibetan, they can read French, German, Italian, Russian, English. Some of these people are amazing. Yeah? They're kind of language geniuses. And so they then bring all of these things together. And what is fascinating is that those suttas that separated from Theravada at the time of Ashoka, you compare them now, they are almost the same. That's 2,200 years ago. Yeah, they have been separated, and they're almost the same in the present day. There are a few changes, and, but most of the changes are not important for understanding the content. The main teachings of the Buddha have obviously been preserved. And that's how we know that we have basically the suttas of the Buddha in the present day, yeah? Because you can see that the, all the traditions of Buddhism were incredibly conservative because they knew they had this treasure in their hands. This treasure, we better preserve it for uh, post posterity, for future generations. That's exactly what they did. And so this is kind of roughly how we know that these suttas are still, um, still available. Uh, so that is how the suttas came about. So but I haven't really answered your question how they came about, because how they came about was the Buddha would speak, and every time the Buddha spoke, the monks would listen, especially Venerable Ananda, who had the best memory at the time. And then he would store up the suttas in his mind. And then after the Buddha passed away, they would be kind of shared out with the whole Sangha. And people would memorize them when they did group recitations. They called Sangiti. Sangiti means like chanting together. And they would do group recitations and then in this way pass it on. Why are there so many suttas instead of just one? Because one sutta is one Discourse by the Buddha is one occasion when the Buddha gave a talk. But the Buddha didn't just give one talk. Yeah? He gave many, 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 many talks uh, because he would pass on the message to many, many people. Uh, so each talk is one sutta. That's basically the idea. So there you are. So that's a 
long answer to a uh, quite a complicated question. There's a lot of history and things that go into that, uh, but it gives you some idea what is going on. Uh, uh, ah. <laughs> the number of questions is more than, than the number of minutes in the hour. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately. I think you're going to have to stop it there because I think it's nice to do a bit of meditation to finish off. Uh, yeah, so let's do that. And we, but I promise we will get to the end of these questions before the end of the retreat. Uh, okay.